So, um, our first slide is pretty basic. It defines a glacier. Um, I was showing this to my daughter over the weekend and, and she asked me a per perfectly logical question. Why is Greenland not all red if the red is supposed to signify glaciers? And some of you who saw the movie uh, realized that um, the glaciers are really the parts that are moving downhill under their own weight as defined over on the left-hand side there. Uh, it's a large body of ice made from compacted snow. And so this vast area of Greenland is compacted snow, but it's not moving anywhere. And what we saw in the video, uh, those of you who didn't get the video and would like to get it, send me an email and I can forward it to you. It's a wonderful video. Uh, it goes on for the best part of an hour. Um, but they point out that um, sometimes they, they can see little holes or lakes forming in the middle of Greenland. And then suddenly on their own, these lakes will uh, disappear. And they just go shooting down a great hole and lubricate the bottom of the glaciers if they're near the periphery. If they're not, it just goes down underneath and just forms a, a lake between the packed ice and the rock of Greenland. And so that's why uh, when you define glaciers in that way, you see the red only in the periphery of Greenland where there's a downhill movement. Um, the important other point on this slide is that we need to sustain, have sustaining low temperatures because um, certain glaciers might expand, some might melt slowly. It's not always uniform around the globe, but if we have massive melting, then of course we're gonna have sea level rise and a problem there. They also point out that uh, glaciers need sustained low temperatures and therefore we only find them at high latitudes near the poles. You can see Antarctica there along the bottom instead of the usual uh, island that we see, we see this big expanse because it's a flattened out map uh, rather than the usual globular shape. And, uh, but again, it's along the periphery where there are some mountains and, and uh, high hills. And the other point at the bottom is that 75% of the earth's land water is locked up in glaciers. By land water, we mean fresh water, but fresh water over, over land rather than in the clouds. And um, uh, so that's a lot of fresh water locked up in glaciers. And that ha has happened over the history of the earth during the cooler phases and the warmer phases. Uh, what's special now, of course, is that we've got a very rapidly warming phase, but uh, the speed of it is, is quite standing. Uh, so that's the point about that slide. And uh, we come to another view if you want to look up uh, glaciers online. They have this nice photograph. It's uh, I'm not sure where it's taken, but it's pretty impressive. Uh, and it makes the point that they lose albedo as they melt because they pick up all this grit from the rocks. I'll give you a little personal story about it. Um, first time I went to Alaska, I took our two of our kids along and we took that route where you, you go to um, up in the Fairbanks and then you take a, a train and it stops halfway along at Denali and you stay, you get 24 hours to stay and then you continue with the train the rest of the way down uh, to Anchorage. And um, so we had a number of possibilities. We could have taken a bus and so on. And since I had my kids along and since I'm a pilot, I thought I really have to let my kids see what it's like in the air. So we, we rented a helicopter and uh, the idea was to go to Denali and fly around it. And it was extraordinarily good weather. And the pilot uh, was an ex-Vietnam pilot. He really knew how to fly this helicopter. It was like an outward extension of his body. And he said, you know, you can see Denali perfectly well from here. Uh, but he said, if you want to have a really fun ride, I can fly down some glaciers for you. And the kids, of course, they were sitting up front with him and they said, sure. And so we flew down these glaciers, just like you see on the slide. And it was really spectacular. Um, uh, it's a wonderful way to see Alaska uh, rather than having to say, well, I flew around Denali and uh, we just enjoyed it immensely. Uh, there's something special about glaciers. People who see them, admire them and, and respect them because they have so much power and they're holding all this water in them. And so they're, they're really awe-inspiring or as, as the young kids say today, awesome. Now, here's an example of a, 
of a glacier that's been melting for a long time in Norway called Bloomstrom Dream. And the top picture shows uh, 1936 and the lower one, 2009. Very same view. So you can see the same uh, structures, um, much larger lake at the bottom of the glacier and much smaller glaciers up in the surrounding hills. 63 years and vast amounts of, of glacial melting in that one in, in uh, Norway. Now, here we come back to the movie that, that uh, uh, we saw. And if you look, I don't know if my, peep, my pointer can show here, but I've got it on, sorry about that. Um, you have to move the pointer slowly or it advances the slide. This was, they talked about often in, in the movie, uh, Jacobson's, I'm not sure what this means, is, is Beale or something like that, but it means a little, a little sound. And we're talking about this thing. And right down at the bottom, they talked in the movie as though this was recently discovered. Uh, and my atlas that I took this picture from is uh, 11 years old. And it says, Jacobson Isbury is the world's fastest moving glacier at 20 meters or 66 feet per day. And that's just what they found in the movie, very comparable number. So, but that is on the west coast opposite Baffin Island in Canada. You go across and this, these two maps are not to scale, they're separate maps taken from uh, different sources, but they're about the same scale. And so over on the right, you see um, a, a place called Scoresby Sund. And um, I, I took a, a trip in, um, I think it was 2000 and seven or so with Dennis Schmidt. And he ran an exploration trip and it went on a Russian, uh, not an icebreaker, but it was a ice strengthened hull, strengthened for the ice. And we were aiming for a place called Warming Island, which is up in the Northern part of this map. And it turns out um, that it used to be a peninsula because of the melting uh, glaciers. Um, it was revealed as they melted away that it wasn't a peninsula at all, but an island. We tried to get there uh, by boat, but it was, by the time he was able to lease the boat, it was late September and the ice was crowding in and we couldn't get there. And so he retreated back down south to this uh, sound that you see here. And if my pointer will allow me, and you can see, we came in here along this sound and we came along in here. And then we went back up weaving through this area, so visited a nice uh, Eskimo colony and uh, where they had, um, uh, dogs for giving people tourists tri uh, trips by uh, ice sled and uh, a school and little clinic. And of course, I was interested to see that as a physician. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. It, it, it was the booby prize for not getting to Worming Island. But uh, so I'll show you some slides from there next. Uh, this is just a, you wonder how it is that you can be so stung, struck by the beauty. These two columns that you see here are connected underwater because this was a big calf calving section of a glacier. And it had been melting all the time. It was slipping out over the ocean, melting from underneath. And eventually, because it was no longer attached to the glacier, it got top heavy as more and more of the under part melted and it just flipped upside down. And so what you're seeing here is the bottom of the glacier and they're connected uh, these two. Uh, so that's not just a, a lone pillar standing there, otherwise it would fall right over, but it's connected with this other one. But I thought it was one of the most beautiful icebergs uh, I saw in the whole time there. It was just a um, spectacular image. And then over on the right, um, I tried to persuade our guide to go through that, that tunnel and he said, oh, the sound of the motorboat might just, we were in a, those little uh, Zodiacs. It was a quiet little motor, but he said the sound might just vibrate that and we could all come down. So we went around it and took pictures of the, of the other ones behind us coming along. But they were, it really made a, a magnificent trip. Very, very quiet there. You couldn't hear, didn't hear a thing except uh, sometimes um, some ice crunching if it was melting or something like that. Um, very, very beautiful area. Oh, and this is from the, the film that you may have seen, the example of these cracks in the ice. And you can see, here on the, on the lower left, um, this man is walking with a careful cane and careful spikes because it's quite tricky. It's rather partially melted in uneven fashion and it, it could slip and fall and hurt yourself. So he's got a cane with him. 
and he's checking it out as he walks along on spike boots and he hears some water and of course the water is coming just out below him here and then he took another picture as he got closer uh, of this uh, water jutting down and that probably goes all the way down uh, to the bottom of the snowpack and wherever he is on, on the you can see there's quite a silhouette there in the distance no mountains around and it would just go down to the snowpack and the next slide shows figuratively what that's like uh, where you have uh, this water you can see on the right here uh, coming down through these crevices uh, lubricating um, the, the what would otherwise be much more friction between the ice resting directly on the rock and as that does so um, it would cause the glacier to, to proceed faster downhill um, sometimes with the weight off of directly off of the rock uh, the actual rock will lift a little bit because of a massive amount of, of weight and so that might come up a little bit but uh, as it does, uh, some of that water that's coming down will displace ocean water and that will circulate back up uh, underneath and, and aid melting even further. So you have uh, a couple of little feedback things. You have the, as the glaciers get dirty, you have less uh, reflection of sunlight and more absorption of uh, infrared rays into the ice. And underneath, as these slide down further and come out over the ocean, you have a little more um, not only lubrication, but but a little more melting underneath the ice. So it's uh, mild perhaps, but still uh, positive feedback. Okay, now we're gonna jump from Greenland over to the Himalayas. And because I think it's a, I've never been to this part of the world, but I'd uh, just to, to India and China, but not to the Himalayas. And there are, 32,000 glaciers in the Himalayas. That's an awful lot. And they provide fresh drinking water, fresh water for drinking for crops and power. For, they have some hydro dams. But what's, what's worrisome is this orange line here that says melting rate has doubled in the last 20 years. And as they melt into lakes, the stability is lost. So you, you start things going and I'll show that a little bit in a few minutes. But what's really concerning is that when you have a steady melting of the glacier all summer, you have steady freshwater and steady uh, rivers, which are nourishing all of Asia. You see over on the extreme uh, right here, all these famous rivers uh, that, that uh, provide water for Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and China. Um, so, as well as Bangladesh and so on. So these are important that they remain st stable. And if you uh, have too much melting of these, then you will have other floods at certain times, or if the glaciers all dry up in certain regions, then you'll have dry periods. This is a little more cl close up. And if you can follow my arrow, um, the Himalayans are divided into, uh, this is called the Western region, this dark brown. Uh, the middle region is orange here and then the eastern region here and I'll especially uh, um, elaborate a little bit on the eastern region because it's near Bhutan and uh, Bhutan always interests me because there's some neat cranes there. <laughs> um, so here are, here are some melting glaciers in Bhutan and they form the ter terminal or termini of glaciers and become as dangerous. Um, these, these lakes that you see forming here uh, up, at, up at the top. The, so the glaciers are melting down and, and these lakes that are forming uh, could break over and wipe out uh, villages down, down the valley. And, and so um, people think they're there for decades, maybe a century, and then suddenly spill over as they continue to melt. Uh, some people call them tsunamis of the skies. There's another picture of them here instead of from space from down low, so you can see what they look like. There are in this region, uh, uh, 700 individual glaciers. I've got that highlighted in yellow there. Uh, and of those 700 glaciers, 2,674 glacial lakes. That's a lot of lakes. Uh, and only fortunately, only 17 are considered potentially dangerous, but still, if you happen to be living downstream from those uh, glacial lakes, they, they could, uh, potentially be dangerous and we'll see some examples a little bit of that later. Um, here you see more of the Eastern Himalaya glaciers and the fragile landscapes 
are, are evident with the scattered settlements and poor infrastructure. And um, so it's hard for them to communicate with the rest of the world or get help if they need it. Um, these are some of the highest mountains in the world in the least developed countries. And so uh, they're gonna suffer from climate change. The people in Bhutan are quite concerned about it and they have a very low carbon footprint as you can imagine. Uh, here are some of the uh, Himalayas as they're going down some valleys in China, I believe. Uh, it shows the potential of water holding through these deep, deep uh, uh, valleys. The rivers will be affected uh, extremely as they flood or dry up. Uh, here's an example of man-made dams that could worsen. This used to be the Kali Gorge in Nepal is one of the deepest in the world, 18,000 foot gorge. Um, it was a great trade route, uh, became a tourist destination, but this dam um, weakened apparently the sides and there was a landslide and you can see the slide direction here and some deposits from the landslide. So they've had some issues there. Moving back to the Alps now, and now we're on the north side of the Alps. If you imagine the Alps are kind of running in a, from uh, the bottom of, of uh, France, Italy, in a bit, of a, a bit of a vertical direction at first, then it kind of curves around. So imagine you're out in space and you're looking south at Italy. And on the right, you see the, uh, uh, the Mediterranean. And on, on the left, you see the uh, Adriatic Sea. And Venice uh, is right there. You can see my little arrow and Trieste is over there. So this is how you're looking south down the boot of Italy. And here is Switzerland and here Germany. And the point of this slide is that it's from the National Geographic that the blue areas of the ice is holding, not much change in temperature, but in the, in the pink to brownish orange and the more, more color uh, shows that uh, there's more melting taking place there. So the Alps are, they're having a problem because there's quite a lot of tourists in Switzerland. And I'll show you some pictures of how they're trying to cope with the loss of the ski seasons. It's a, it's a big issue for them. Um, so uh, they're, they've lost in 150 years, 170 years now, two thirds of their volume, these Alpine glaciers. So, and, it, and it'd be one thing if they could have predicted it, but it's accelerating and that makes it all the more difficult for them to, to plan ahead. Uh, here is an example of using radar on the left uh, you can see a guy over there with his skis and some computers and, and various uh, kinds of, of uh, radar to uh, determine the depth of the ice so that they can see if it's, if, how much it's accelerating. On the right, we see where a glacier used to be. And uh, you could walk across the glacier. Now you can't, so they put in a footbridge for people to walk over that gap. A little vertical line there, I'm sorry about is it's a, it was taken from National Geographic and I, I split the binding to get a nice junction, but it does still leave a little white vertical line there in those photographs, but gives you an idea of uh, the great loss in Switzerland. Some of the ice caves are still there. Uh, and so people still go in and explore those. On the right, you can see uh, people who are like to go up instead of down. So they put on lines and boots and so on and, and try and climb up these ice, uh, frozen ice uh, falls in a way. Uh, this is the idea of trying to conserve ice in the summer. They use on the left a, a giant straw mat, and that will help to hold that base of ice so that when they make ice later on in the winter, when it gets cold enough, they can, they can spray the uh, snow up onto those. At least there's a base layer there. And over on the right, you see they, they use an actual plastic sheet. You can see a little opening in the plastic sheet because there's an ice cave there, and they want people to, to go in there that, allow them but, and to air to move, but all of that is a giant piece of plastic that covers several acres. I hope that plastic doesn't uh, disintegrate. It looks like a pretty durable one, but it reminds you when you look at that picture of somebody who's left home and left drapes over the grand piano or something, and you see uh, all this furniture, but it's not furniture. Those are beautiful ski hills that uh, they went to save through the blistering summers that they're now getting in parts of the Alps. Uh, okay, changing tack a little bit. This is now looking at the Arctic. And uh, down at the bottom, you can see these bars. And there are some dark ends to the bars. And those relate to different mountain ranges 
and you can see a little uh, black ends to them, and they relate to the change in the first time the first snows until the last snow, and the increased size of the of the black bars at the ends of those horizontal bars relate to uh, over a 21 year period the average fact that the snow is coming uh, melting earlier. Um, sorry, the snow is starting later. They, they're counting. I'm sorry. They're counting snow days. So the snow days are the light parts of the bars and the, the change in snow days are the dark ends of the bars. So that they're coming in the Brooks range now that those are have letters. I don't know how you can, yeah, they're not too bad. You can see there uh, the letter A for the Brooks range and the Brooks range is over here uh, on the Bering Sea there. And, and you can see that it's, uh, uh, the snow is coming later and leaving earlier. So the last, the snow days are diminishing. Uh, they have some other examples here. Um, the Skeena Mountains are over here in Alaska. And uh, uh, I'll show those in a few moments. Uh, I visited uh, a lovely place called the Conte Glacier. It's the southernmost glacier that empties into the sea in Alaska, south of uh, Juneau. And uh, I have a couple of pictures from that. Um, there are also a couple of others here way down in Nevada where uh, they're having some changes. Anyway, coming to what I was talking about, Alaska's Conte Glacier, uh, we kayaked up there, my wife and I did back in 2004, and uh, they wouldn't let us get any closer than that. Uh, they were afraid that, that there might be some calving and a big wave come by. Um, we certainly didn't see anything like that. It looked pretty stable back in 2004, and I imagine it's accelerated quite a bit since then. But uh, it was quite, inspiring, if you can imagine canoeing up in a, or kayaking up to close to one of those uh, uh, glaciers. And then I just got intrigued by the icebergs. You can see the background of the Conte Glacier uh, way up in the top of that mountainside. And uh, this little bird-like critter of an iceberg was floating by. And then I found another little one right near where we were camped. And uh, I was just intrigued by the shapes of these. Sometimes bigger icebergs would come by and, and as the tide would go down, they would uh, rest on this kelp covered rock. And in the middle of the night, you'd hear them groaning because as they would melt and the molecules would pull apart, these things would settle a little bit and they just groaned. So if you were sort of a superstitious person and thought that there might be ghosts out there, um, if you looked out in the morning, they weren't ghosts at all. They were just groaning glaciers that were straining out of the way. Okay, now we're gonna take a trip to Svalbard. I, should have shown you where Svalbard was, but it's right up at the top of, you can see Greenland here. You're looking at it from the perspective of Alaska and Siberia and Kamchatka Peninsula here. And, and of course the Arctic Ocean is just a big frozen mass, but way here, right at the top, with not very far from the North Pole, but just in the Arctic Circle is an island that belongs to Norway called Svalbard. And when we went to Greenland, we met a guy who was just a real explorer. And he said, next year, I'm going to go to Svalbard. It's the first time I've ever heard of the place. When he went there, he wrote me letters and sent me pictures. And he was just thrilled with the place. So I'd always heard of it with enthusiastic minds. And then this article came in the National Geographic. And I couldn't resist including it for you. Isn't that a spectacular picture of the uh, gigantic amounts of ice on this island? It's an, actually an archipelago, quite a few islands, and only one large one is populated. The other ones are left as parks, so there are a lot of parks there. And uh, so the, the um, author wrote, uh, uh, to visitors, the Norwegian archipelago can be seen both ethereal and eternal, but climate change all but guarantees an eventual collapse of its vulnerable ecosystem. And he emphasizes that through the article. Uh, this is a, a map of the area. And what's in red then is the populated part uh, called Spitsbergen. Sometimes you may have heard that word used for that island. And the biggest town in Spitsbergen is in capitals there, Long Yearsbyen. <laughs> I guess they have a long year there or something, uh, but it's a cute name. So all these pale 
areas that are part of the archipelago and there are a lot of, uh, of parks and, and protected areas all around there. Um, this, these are the, this picture was taken at midnight. So the sun uh, in the summertime doesn't set. And uh, uh, these are where the people lived there who were manning the power station and the airport and uh, uh, some tourism. Those are the big industries. Tourism thrives here. And I hate to tell you, but there's also a horrible thing called coal mining. I have a real problem with coal, as I mentioned, all of you do too. And fishing is important, of course, and tourism. But they, uh, they've been mining coal there. The, the Norway, the mainland Norway, doesn't have any coal mining, don't have any coal plants. This is the only place within the jurisdiction of Norway where there is a coal mine. And people are getting the message. They themselves realize that they're on this vulnerable island or archipelago. And here they've got a coal mine and a coal plant. And maybe they should do something about it. And they actually wrote recently to say, they're gonna switch. But instead of switching to a nice compact nuclear reactor, of course, they're switching to diesel plant. So they're gonna ship in some diesel and they think that'll be a little bit better. Well, it certainly won't improve the carbon dioxide situation, but might improve the dirt and the, the, the coal dust. Um, this is a, I found this a fascinating painting. It's by Cornelius de Man in 1636, 39. And it shows that the whaling industry, which started around 1600 in the Atlantic, was really going strong here. And so these people would come in and you can see the whale, uh, looked like a sperm whale here. They were cutting off blubber and guys are up there with big saws and they take it up and put it in these big, big vats and boil it down. And so um, I'm not quite old enough to remember my grandparents, uh, but they, had, they used to tell me they had whale oil lamps and that's what they used before kerosene came along. And um, kerosene, by the way, was discovered by a physician in New Brunswick. And he worked on a long time to find out something that would give more light and uh, last longer than whale oil. But up until that time, and that, that was another hundred years or so later, uh, before that happened, people used whale oil for a lot of things, including their lamps. So here you see people in the foreground talking with one another, some of the big, big guys with the money about uh, how many whales they were gonna catch. And, and you can see their ships here in the distance. I think it's a fascinating thing because we, it's just the way you wouldn't think of Spitsbergen or, uh, or Svalbard today. This is what it looks like today. And these are the people uh, who are uh, living in and looking after uh, the coal mining, the coal plant, the electricity, which you can see in these, in these uh, pilings here, go across to the airport and provide power for the airport. So this now is uh, some notes from Marcus Westberg who wrote the article I was referring to in National Geographic. He said, the, is, I just put his words here because they just describe his feelings. The Arctic world was constantly shifting around me as we slowly made our way through the ice and open sea past whales, walruses, birds, and bears. I had that same feeling going up to Greenland. It's really spectacular feeling wondering if you're gonna make it. Of course we didn't, we had to, Turn around and go back before we got stuck in the ice but he got through and uh, he said uh, this far north of the arctic circle really kind of on the edge of it the sun doesn't go near the horizon yet Svalbard seemingly timeless is really a ticking clock he was intrigued with the little ox that were carrying food to their young in the sky there he found Svalbard to be the most vast expanse of water ice and islands that he felt it to be the epitome of untouched wilderness and he began to care for the entire archipelago. It was nice to see it in his writing. And he does make the point that there are 29 national parks and protected areas that cover two thirds of the archipelago, protect its wildlife from hunting and pollution. But of course, parks alone cannot stop higher air and water temperatures. And as the glaciers and ice cover shrink every year, all life from polar bears to phytoplankton become more threatened. And you can see the polar bear uh, there on the lower right. Uh, World Wildlife Fund uses the polar bear as their emblem, and they try to get a lot of empathy. And uh, if they weren't so anti-nuclear, I'd be more empathetic with them. But they, uh, I, I did a little bit of reading on polar bears and I'm told that if they have too much trouble um, with the loss of ice in the Arctic, that they will, they at least predict that they will go down and mate with the grizzlies. And the grizzlies, uh, and they are compatible, they're hybrids or, or fertile. And they think that we'll just have it emerge of uh, just as we've seen with uh, sandhill cranes. There are six different subspecies of 
of Sand Hill Crane. They got separated by glaciers over the years. They separated into these species, the lesser Sand Hill and the larger Sand Hill. And perhaps the same thing will happen with the, with the polar bears. So I don't know that we need to cry too hard for the polar bears. I feel sorry for them when they're swimming a long distance, but they'll catch on and start to, to move uh, onto the tundra, I think, and meet some friendly grizzly bears. At least I, I hope so. Anyway, the wildlife perspectives are shown in some lovely photographs here of terns. And the polar bear, I think, is looking for a little seal or something that uh, might come up within reach. Uh, hazardous activities also are there for the geologists who are driven to explore. They keep finding evidence of ice melt draining deep into the bedrock, just as we saw for Greenland. And this is a lovely uh, aerial shot over Spitsbergen uh, and some tourism flourishing. I added the words until when. Uh, you can see on the, on the right there, it looks not too different from uh, the pictures I showed you of Greenland. One last slide of uh, Svalbard. This was just taken um, uh, recently from a website that this is the last coal mine called Gruve 7. Doesn't that sound so Swedish? Gruve. And it's right there. And then uh, Energverket is where they burn the stuff. And you can see the power lines going off to other parts of, of uh, Spitsbergen. It burns 25,000 tons of coal every year for heat as well. There are heat ducts as well as electricity for the airport in the town. They do say they'll get renewables later, but lots of luck. What kind of renewable is gonna supply Spitsbergen? I'm not so sure that they'll get very much sun up there for about six months of the year. Anyway, um, moving now to India, and I'm gonna focus a little bit now on uh, the Ganges River. Um, 400 million people live along the Ganges River. That's more than the population of the United States just living along the two banks of that river. I'll show you a picture of the origin of the Ganges, but you can see down in the lower left, the water volumes in the various tributaries uh, that go out to sea. Uh, and you can see it up here. Also the area that's uh, uh, enlarged over the Himalayas. So there, it's from a National Geographic, of course, but it's a, it's a fascinating, you can see Nepal there, Bhutan there, China up there. And this is the whole basin of the Ganges. I'm gonna focus on it a little bit because it has, it's rather pertinent to some of our problems that I'm gonna merge into. I've told you enough about glaciers. Let's look at the origin there on the left and on the right, floating floral tributes are often plastic. When people die in India, as you know, they often um, in, uh, make a, a funeral pyre and, and they burn, um, um, cremate the, the bodies. Oftentimes they have them on rafts and they float down the river and with or without them on the rafts, they always put in a floral wreath or some sort of a floral display. In the old days, they used to be flowers. Bad enough that the wreaths were all wired together. So the wire was going downstream, but now they're making the flowers out of plastic and they're fairly durable plastic. And you can see this market here on the right. And most of those flowers are plastic and they throw those into the river along with everything else. And so this accumulates underwater. And when you look at it, think of it globally, a garbage truck full of plastic goes into the oceans every minute. Pretty horrible thought. And you can see it all broken up, breaking down into microplastics in this slide. And I didn't take that picture. It wasn't quite bad when I went to Madagascar and some of the islands north of there, but uh, so it's gotten quite a bit worse. This is a more recent picture. Um, what we used to find uh, 20 years ago was uh, sandals. People would have them on their boats as they'd be sailing along and a wave would come and they hadn't tucked the sandals away. So there are lots of sandals, but now 20 years later, it's uh, mostly plastic you can see here and various other trash, incredible. So gonna have a little mini talk here about plastic. Um, I never realized before that plastic can be distributed in the air. I never thought of it. We always think of it as in, in the ground, in the water, but apparently it can also get in the air. Uh, these first uh, two top topics, the surface micro layer relates to the water only, but that's quite enriched in microplastics and various floating loads uh, on the water surface uh, expand quite a range. But then the third point here, suspended load applies to the water in the air. And these are very fine plastics. Some are spherical, some aspherical or angular. 
but they're of a size that they can remain suspended in the water or even float up into the air and potentially dominated by nanoplastics or, or uh, very small ones. And then of course you have the bed load either in water and air. So this gives you an idea. Um, I just wasn't nearly as aware, maybe you were, but, but there's a lot of plastic in the air and it's floating around as well as on the water surface. Um, this is just another uh, show of the pervasive plastic pollution. You can see in the arrows of going up and down, some of it going up, some of it falling down into the oceans, this microplastic flux, they call it. And these are the plants that are uh, providing power, but some of them are in, uh, sending in the hot air. There's some plastics, uh, fumes that go up. And of course, there's incinerators. We're incinerating about 11% of our plastic today. Um, we, I think, bury about 9% and the other 80% or 79% uh, just sits around in uh, um, areas that are not buried or incinerated in various landfills. So these are the different ways. There's an exchange between land and the ocean here, plastic flowing down rivers, uh, even some plastics. Sometimes uh, farmers have uh, put down a plastic bed to hold and prevent erosion, and that forms into little plastics and gets off into the water. So uh, how, is, how does it get to us? Uh, well, it gets to not only to us, the terrestrial plastic gets to uh, various species of reptiles, birds and mammals as shown on this left circle. And the size of the circle represents the percent of the families of reptiles, birds or mammals that have been shown to have uh, plastics ingested in them. So uh, we're starting out here and these, these little parts of the circle under terrestrial indicate that it's less than 10% of mammals, birds and reptiles yet have, uh, that live on land, yet have plastic that, are, that they've ingested in their body. But if you go to fresh water and you look at fresh water, bony fishes, reptiles, birds, and mammals, you're approaching, and in the case of, uh, of bony fishes, you actually are passing 25%. So each one of those concentric circles then, uh, relate to a 100% circle and you're, you're uh, just using it as a convenient way. Instead of reading across a bar chart, you're looking at a circular chart. And look at that marine, wow. That's a big, big difference uh, from the terrestrial and freshwater. The uh, sharks and rays pick it up. Uh, mammals also uh, are 100, um, a very high percentage, I think 100% there. And the birds, about 100% have some plastic in them. Reptiles, not quite so many. And uh, bony fishes, sharks and rays, a little bit less, but they're all over 25%. So it's pretty shocking. Uh, and these are the number of species reported in the literature in the past 40 years, from 1980 until last year. And these are both macro and micro plastics. Um, and I think you've seen pictures of birds particularly seabirds who pick up this sort of thing and then they can't swallow anymore. Their, their uh, swallowing mechanism is totally interfered with by the massive amount of plastic in the crop and they just starve, uh, just tragic. So here we see marine food, food webs on the left are the Arctic and temperate food webs from phytoplankton. And you see these arrows coming up uh, to the top predators along the top of the page being uh, eels, and sharks and polar bears and working their way up through the various predators. Uh, over on the oceanic food webs, both tropical and subtropical, as opposed to temperate, very similar. But you see more uh, diff different kinds of predators going through whales and tuna and turtles and from uh, uh, smaller organisms and working their way up to uh, probably tuna on the top. Anyway, large, large uh, oceanic top web. And the top predator for the coral and rocky reefs, they've got the shark pictured there. And there they have micro algae. These would be the, the kelp and so on that might uh, uh, break off and, and they might um, pick up the little macro parts of, uh, micro parts of, of uh, plastic. And these suspended uh, things and they just work their way up the, the food web to the to the predators and the top predators. And in the freshwater, you can see uh, even uh, alligators and uh, uh, cod, it looks like, uh, various uh, sturgeon maybe, 
other fish or top predators of the freshwater food web. Now, I don't want to bore you with this, but we do need to understand plastics a little bit more than I've told you so far. Uh, this is an interesting table. It's a little hard to, to understand, but I'll try and, and describe it for you as simply as I can. There are different kinds of plastic, of course, we know that, it's polyethylene, and that gets into sandwich bags, trays, and food packaging. But look at the number there. Those numbers are the number of million tons per year produced. These are the amounts that are produced. And polypropylene is off to the left. And you can see it's not quite so bad, about half as bad in terms of the amount produced as the polyethylene, food packaging, snack wrappers, microwave containers, and even some parts of cars. Then we get polyvinyl chloride or PVC, and we all know about that. We have that in a lot of plumbing today, and various uh, hoses and so on. It's also in window frames. Now, the nice thing about that is that doesn't very often make microplastics. Those, are, those would be fairly stable around the house. And, and uh, as long as we're careful when we have to dispose of those window frames and things like that, that they're not, uh, don't enter the, the garbage uh, uh, and they find a better way to be disposed of. And then we have uh, uh, polystyrene. These are much smaller amounts here, about a quarter as much polyurethane and building isolation, insulation. And this is a, an important one here called polyethylene terephthalate, or if you have trouble with that word, PEP for short, or water bottles, soft drink bottles and cleaner bottles. Uh, that's a big problem. I remember, as you can gather from what I'm saying, I like to travel, or I did a lot of traveling. And everywhere I went, these tour companies, they're afraid of getting sued and somebody got dehydrated. So they insist that you take these water bottles with you. And uh, I would just flatly say, no, I, I knew enough to drink. Uh, you know, I don't want to drink too much. I'm going to be stopping at the washroom and you may not have one available. So I refuse them, but a lot of people don't. And, uh, and we just way, way too much of that sort of thing. And so what are we going to do about that? Well. What about how they degrade? And uh, you can see that uh, these things in orange are older. Some of these cellulose nitros combs and things and various belts and, and uh, fashion belts and things are, are they, they fall apart. And the classic one is polyurethane. And you can see how this arrow going down shows how the polyurethane microscopically breaks down. Uh, but polyethylene terephthalate, what we've been talking about here, is a more common plastic in the modern world. And we really need to do something about that. Polymethyl, um, methacrylate is just acrylic. And that's on our TV sets and things like that. But this is the, is the, is the real uh, PET. Here is the real thing that people have been excited about. So they thought, well, let's recycle this stuff. So they started looking at the chemistry and they found that there are some enzymes that digest PET. These are bacterial enzymes, so you can uh, uh, chew these things up, heat them up, and use bacterial enzymes and break them apart. And then you can further break them apart with another enzyme uh, and break them up into smaller segments. And then you can use these smaller segments to make some new stuff. And you can make it in a newer shape or a newer use and so on. And everybody says, well, that's just great. Uh, uh, and there's an example of digested on the, on the, there's a mass on the right. And then after you've digested it, there are a few little flakes, but all the little fine stuff that you've, you've made fine has all been, been digested and, and uh, uh, used to, to make new product. But I just found this last Friday. This is a new slide, and I'm afraid it's a little lengthy and I won't read it all. I, I subscribe to a group called Tree Hugger, and this guy, Lloyd Alter, I think is his name, uh, puts this out every day. And this was an interesting thing. He says, recycling pet is difficult and expensive, but industry claims that it's, it's a good thing and it should, we should do it because, not for that they're that concerned about the environment, but they don't want uh, the environmentalists to say, look, we want to ban plastic and go back to bottles and mandatory deposits for bottles. And we, we're past that. We've got to keep this pet, we'll keep people enthused enough if we recycle it. Well, now there's a study published in the Journal of Hazardous Materials and they suggest that the safety implications arising from reprocessing of pet bottles is underexplored. Pretty careful word, underexplored. But Brunel University in London has found as many as 150 food contact chemicals or FCCs 
that could be migrating into the contents of these bottles as they get recycled, the PET, <coughs> excuse me, uh, some of the stuff gets in it and they found some antimony and some bisphenol A, you've all heard about that or BPA, has been found in these recycled PET bottles. And so they think this is kind of odd because antimony is a catalyst used in the production of the P, excuse me, PET resin and has been discussed and argued about for years. But um, it normally it's used in polycarbonates and epoxies lining cans, but it generally is not involved in the production of PET in the first place. So it shouldn't be there at all. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, but um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, there might be better solutions than what we've described so far. And we should be aware of the problem that we've started. You know, this, we, plastics were discovered and started to be used around 1950. I remember when toys, kids' toys, I was just 12 years old back then and I thought, boy, these plastics are kind of neat, uh, better than lead toy soldiers and things like that. But, but uh, that was fine back then. <laughs> but uh, the year 2000, we started getting quite a few and here we are about there in 2020. And they're predicting that this is going to follow, if, if we don't do anything, it will follow what's called a, a, a cubic curve. And uh, we will have vast, vast amounts of it by the end of the century if we don't do something. And uh, so this is the, this red curve is the projected accumulation. And so far, we haven't been doing much. We've been concerned about them for the last 20 years, talk about them, but we haven't done an awful lot. So these are some thoughts. Uh, on the left panel here, you have the idea of just reducing. They, we use 368 million tons of virgin plastics every year uh, with production expected to double in 20 years. And so the first goal is to minimize the virgin plastic production and consumption, just find ways to minimize it, find other, other things, just don't make so much and try and push it on people so much. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, they're pointing out that only 9% of the plastics ever produced have been recycled and 12% incinerated. So 80% are accumulating in landfills. So the goal number two is to find ways to re facilitate circularity, just as we talked for PET. It might be feasible. We certainly shouldn't ignore it, uh, but we should just be careful uh, when we do that, particularly for the PET ones that we've been talking about. Also, the third goal is to eliminate plastic pollution in the environment. And what I'm hoping is that we can do is start thinking more carefully about what goes in our rivers. Uh, I think we need to educate a lot of the people in Asia. Um, they don't seem to be aware of this plastic problem. And um, it's not that a lot of us are not aware, but, but this is a global problem. We can't just solve it in the United States alone. And uh, I think if we can start to think this way about our pollution of the oceans, um, we can uh, hopefully do more than just get rid of the plastic, but uh, uh, get rid of a lot of other things that are going into the oceans. So in this idea of closing the plastics loops, they're talking about designing the polymers for monomer recovery. So ask the manufacturers not to make quite such complex ones, but to make them so that they're easier to take apart and either uh, change it to something that we can or can't use, but at least make it easier to chemically uh, get rid of them so they don't accumulate and turn into microplastics. By the way, nobody knows yet uh, how much damage microplastics do. Um, it, it's yet to be determined. They have not found any cancer causing effects unless I was a cancer researcher and we did study that a little bit, but if you put plastic in between layers of tissue in an experimental animal, you can induce sarcomas, but that has to do with tissue and mobility and putting in sheets of plastic. We never had, when I was a researcher, we never thought about microplastics. This is something that's only come up in the last 10 years or so. And so I don't know that, I'm sure they're out there studying it, but I'm not aware of it inducing cancer or having any other long-term effects, but, um, but it's a huge problem for marine organisms. And that's what I wanted to emphasize to you in some of the earlier slides. Um, it, it's just shocking how many fish, aquatic birds and so on uh, get uh, die in, um, as a result of our plastic bags that get into the oceans. So they're talking here about uh, site-specific bond cleavage. 
in number two, and then further disassembly here in, in three into monomers, and then harvesting perhaps some water, some methane that they can use, and uh, uh, bearing the CO2 or, or binding it uh, in some way with calcium so that it, it makes a carbonate and is not released CO2 again. So you might be able to do some good things. If we can't reuse it and make new plastics, maybe we can just design the plastic so that we can harvest its constituents uh, later from some of these uh, water bottles, which are gonna be very hard to get rid of. So it's now almost five to 11. And I wanna just rather than end this in this note, just to give you some take homes. So we've talked about three things here today. Melting glaciers, while not major tipping points, can rapidly threaten our welfare or survival, mostly by affecting river flows adversely and slowly or elevating oceanic sea levels. The second thing we talked about was Svalbard, just because I'm kind of intrigued with it, and I thought you might be too, is an Arctic gem. Still, uh, we mine there and burn coal there, but we hope that maybe they'll smarten up and, and maybe get a small nuclear reactor instead of a diesel plant. Um, plastic pollution we focused on for the last 15 minutes or so, and it's not yet an obvious threat to our lives, but I'm hoping it'll motivate us to clean up our thoughtless behavior about polluting in general, and marine wildlife will thank us. So there is my talk, my slide share, and I see I've got some chats, eight of them. So let me see if I can answer some of them. Um, George asks, any of these Northern communities would be great for <laughs> molten salt reactors. Hey, George. Uh, you and I think alike, yeah. Uh, molten salt reactors are a special kind of nuclear reactor where you do not have to encapsulate the isotope in um, these special metallic sleeves. And it allows the several things to happen, but it, it just makes it much more efficient and safer. The, the, when the molecules, because the fuel is in liquid state, they, as they get warmer, they separate more and therefore they generate less heat. And so, it's an automatic uh, heat dissipation system has many other advantages. So I agree with George, it's part of the generation four. Today we use generation two reactors and we just finished building a generation three reactor and it's gonna be going soon, uh, the Votel one in uh, Georgia, but, um, but they're very expensive and very cumbersome and the small modular reactors and especially if they're generation four, you can have smaller ones and you can gang them up or gang them back down to make them appropriate for the size of the community. And um, so George made a good point there. Steve says, we are part of the 100% mammals, part of the plastic ingestion circle. Yes, we definitely are. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a lot of plastics in our environment. George says to everyone, a bull contents himself with one meadow. A forest is enough for a hundred elephants, but the little body of a man devours more than all other living creatures. And this is a quote from Seneca, who is a Roman senator. That's an interesting quote, I'll read it again. A bull contents himself with one meadow, a forest is enough for a hundred elephants, but the little body of a man or woman devours more than all other living creatures. Huh. I'm not sure per body weight that we devour more, but maybe he's meaning our appetite is more. Elephants maybe focus on just a few plants, uh, uh, a cow or a bull, uh, different kinds of grasses. But we have such a wide array of tastes that we dibble into the oceans, we dibble into the forest, we dibble everywhere. So we have a chance to interfere more and uh, mess around with plastics as well. Uh, LG, LG, Lee. She says, gardening supply companies sell rolls of plastic sheeting for use in the garden as weed barriers. But these plastic sheets may actually break down into microplastics and get into the garden plants that we questionable eat. That could be true. I think we should be really careful about putting plastic in our gardens. She then says to everyone, if, if the plastics were made more easy to break down, then how much plastic may break off in the consumable liquids in a bottle of something like olive oil, ketchup, juices, or pop. That's true. We have to be very careful if we change the way we make things, and I'm sure they'll do that, um, uh, that we don't uh, uh, contaminate ourselves. Not sure yet, says Bill Timmick, 
we, I'm not sure yet if we can convince the plastic manufacturers to change unless we have a list of the top 10 worst of the worst, we would also need to know which plastics they manufactured. Now that this information is widespread today. Very true, Bill. And Lou Kernish says to everyone, polychlorinated biphenols bind to fat and cause bioamplification, increasing their concentration as we move upward in the food web. Does PET or other plastics do the same? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, that's something we can look into, Lou, and maybe uh, when you're talking to us, Lou will be our speaker in a couple of weeks, and uh, we can see if between, between the two of us, we can come up with some answers for that question. Good one to think about, Lou. Let's see. I think that's uh, it. Uh, George is gonna send me some more iceberg images and I'll forward them to you. Um, I think that's it. Pretty much, let's see if there's anything else here. I've got a question and answer thingy. And uh, people are saying that it's very clear they can see everything, so that's good. I'm glad that it went well. How about our live audience? I'm gonna tip this down a little bit so I can, yeah, you're, you're sitting off on the side so I can see you. Any questions from the live audience? Well, I'm glad that you all came. It's, uh, uh, any questions from the... Zoom audience? I guess it was all pretty clear. <laughs> Just about wrapped up. Uh, so next week, uh, Alan Pentecost will be here. He's driving up from Rockford, Illinois. And uh, Alan is an editor of Mr. Green Car, which is a column in one of the Rockford papers. He, uh, he likes uh, electric vehicles, but he's gonna talk to us about the electricity map. This is an amazing uh, website and you can go on the map and find out how each country or sometimes regions of a country make their electricity. For example, if you go to Norway, you find the different parts of Norway are cleaner than others, depending upon how much hydro they have, how much uh, uh, of this and that and the other thing. Um, most of the European countries are portrayed especially well in this, on this map. But you can also see North America. Um, it's a little harder because we have bigger grids and they're, they're uh, so for example, um, and the grids are named slightly differently with different overlaps, but uh, our grid, it's not so good here. Not nearly as good as, uh, as some of the grids in the northeastern part of the United States, and not nearly as good as our neighboring province of Ontario, where they have a lot of nuclear power. So they do not have to use coal. Ontario doesn't burn a drop of coal. and hasn't for several years. Uh, they have some natural gas, but not much. And uh, they get most of their electricity from Niagara Falls and from nuclear plants that are distributed along the Great Lakes like Ontario and Lake Huron. And uh, so they're very clean in Ontario. Quebec is totally hydro. They built uh, hydro plants on the rivers that drain into Hudson Bay and all, virtually all of their electricity is from hydro. And uh, it's very, very clean. So they're doing fine too. Um, some of the Western states in this country are doing well, uh, Oregon and Washington state because they also have hydro. But uh, the essence that uh, I think Alan might point out to you next week is the difference between Germany and France. They're countries side by side and they've approached electricity totally differently. And I think I'll let him focus on that next week. I think you'll find that quite interesting. It's an app that you can easily uh, download yourself and he will, he will show you, I'm hoping, live how to make, he'll have some slides, but uh, I'll have my computer here and he may be able to show you how it works. Uh, so that you can follow up more easily. It's a fairly easy website to you, but I think it's fascinating because you can get so much information. You talk to the average individual today, where's your electricity coming from? How much do you have of this and that and the other thing? Most people don't know, I just plug it in and it's there. So why, why should I care? Well, Alan drives an electric vehicle. 
and so do I, and, and a number of people um, on our, we have a group called Friends of Fission, and we're obviously prejudiced in favor of fission. We don't use the word nuclear because it's got some bad connotations in, in uh, politics. People call the nuclear option as though it's a bomb or something. And so uh, we're trying to use the word fission to distinguish it from fusion, which is quite a ways away, and to point out that until fusion comes along, uh, fission is a very good and safe way to make energy and to back up renewables uh, without uh, burning methane. And uh, that would be good to do. So you'll hear from Ellen next week and then Lou the week after that. And we'll try and uh, tell your friends here in, in, in Oakwood to come along and uh, join the crowd. So there's, it's nice to have a, a gathering here. We used to meet here all the time until COVID came along. And uh, it's been two years now since uh, we were kind of banned from here. <laughs> and Oakwood is welcoming us to come back. And we're having these, these three sessions hybrid so we can, some people who are having a hard time, a number of these people who have been speaking are in Chicago, Minneapolis, and various other parts of the world, and they don't have to drive here. So that's fine. And we save some gasoline or electricity. And, uh, but those of you who live here in Oakwood are, invited it's free you don't even have to join plato you're welcome although we encourage you to do so but uh you're welcome to attend so tell your friends and neighbors to join us so so long see you all next week <laughs> oh there's some messages okay let's see if we if i can find some more messages oh uh bill says remind folks of the outreach for nuclear advocates training um, oh, here it is. There's the group, Nuclear Advocacy 101, a virtual event presented by Nuclear Matters. It's on Thursday, one o'clock. Interested in brushing up on your nuclear energy advocacy skills? Bill comes from Virginia, and he's a great teacher uh, out in Virginia, and it was kind of him to do that. So uh, uh, I can try and forward that to anybody who sends me an email, okay, rather than send it out to everybody. But I've already registered for that. I'm looking forward to doing it. No, that'll be online. Um, it's a webinar uh, called Nuclear Advocacy 101. It's, it's not so much about nuclear energy. It's to help people who are convinced on the value of nuclear energy to, to spread the word around, to help you become a better advocate. And so I'd like to learn how, and I, I, I plan to attend, but I'll probably be home. That'll be on a Thursday at one in the afternoon. It would be nice if you, I might, I might send it to everybody, but if I don't, send me an email and ask me to send, it, okay? Fair enough? I'll try to do it within a week. It's not until April the 27th, so we've got some time. Today's the 11th, so we've got two weeks, two weeks in a day, right? Oh, it's not, it's not there. It isn't there. Uh, it's just a, that's just a, yes, exactly. That's just the time. So you sound like you're interested. So I'll make a note, but if I, if I forget, okay. Yeah, I'll try and send it around and it wouldn't be difficult to do. I can send it around to everybody. Um, I'm just not accustomed to having such keen nuclear advocates join us. Yeah. And we have a, we have a group, Friends of Fission. If you want to join our group, please do. You can do that too. The, if you want to know a little bit about Friends of Fission, you can find the story about it at rethinkingnuclear.org. One, all one word, rethinkingnuclear, no spaces in between, dot org. And when you get the website, if you go to the top left column, it says Friends of Fission. And you can read all about it and the myths and you'll see a little bit of that website comparison I told you about between Germany and France. It's right there on the website. So, thank you for asking, Mary. And um, I missed your name, sir. I shouldn't remember. Just refresh my name, my memory. Barry Golden. Yeah, I see you all the time on our thing. I should have recognized you. <laughs> it's nice that we can take our masks off, at least we're far enough removed that before we get out of here, we got to put them back on. Do you, do you live here, Barry? Yeah. Good. Good for you. 
in Oakwood. Okay. And you also, Mary, right? You live in Madison. You live in Barneville. That's right. My goodness. Yeah, I appreciate your coming all the way here. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Uh, Was it the one by Gates? The global. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. Those are kind of large slides to send around, but I'll give you a tip. If you go to platomadison.org, platomadison, all one word, dot org, and then you go to recorded sessions, this has been recorded today and being recorded right now, I expect, or so, yeah, we're still live. And so um, you can find it all there uh, at that website. And, and they, they go back about a full year, all the things that... Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. Yep, you could take screenshots and uh, the ones that are particularly interesting to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so long everybody. It's lovely to have you there. See you next week. <laughs>